Hello everyone, this is John Mark Johnson Jr. again, host of Relationship and Truth, and this video is especially for a, um, a an LDS person named Jessica. And Jessica, I'm not entirely sure what your um, what your interactions with non-LDS folks has been like, especially people claiming to be, you know, biblical Christians and that kind of thing. And um, based on the response that you re recently gave me on Facebook, I've I'm kind of assuming it hasn't been all that productive because um, some of the things that um, some of the things that you said sounded, you know. Of, frankly a little acidic and for my part in that I apologize if in our conversation that's how you took anything that I said and granted I am typically a very blunt person um, and that is because in biblical Christianity and particularly reformed Christianity that is a mark of respect if you care about someone you're going to be honest and direct with them you're not going to hide anything you're not going to try to and I divert away from anything, you're going to be honest and direct with them. And that's what I'm trying to be with you. And like I said, I apologize if I was anything less than specific on that one. And if I didn't uh, communicate uh, the care and respect that a fellow image bearer of God deserves, um, not because of anything that they've necessarily done or haven't done, but just simply because they are an image bearer of God. And of course, that means something different from a Reformed Christian to an LDS person. I get that. But still, within my own faith tradition, I am required to be um, respectful and also suitably gentle. And that's what I'm trying to do here. And that's why I didn't want to type something out, Jessica. I wanted to actually, you know, give you a face to look at, make an apology for anything that I uh, said that was, you know, not in keeping with um, a, a biblical uh, standard. Obviously, I'm not going to adhere to an LDS standard because I'm not LDS, but there is still a biblical standard that I must adhere to, and that's what I'm trying to do here. And so I'm appearing in person, at least via video, to you know show you that respect and also try to give you that care and concern. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to respond to your, your latest response that we've been having here. This is a really old conversation. Um, that you just uh, got back to, and I really, really, really appreciate the fact that you got back to it, Jessica. So let's go ahead and see the, the response here. You say, John M. Johnson Jr., I don't know how I missed your reply so long ago. You're welcome, because I had thanked her. For those of you who don't know, I had thanked her for uh, responding uh, to an original message that I'd put on one of the LDS uh, original posts. And she uh, gotten on there, and she was one of the people who responded to it. And so, <laughs> thank you, Jessica, for that. And then she goes right into the discussion, getting back into what we were, and she says, And I'm not in error. That is, in one of the previous messages, I had said, Thank you very much for responding, but you're in error. Here's why. And boom, 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 very direct. I tried to be very clear. Maybe I wasn't. Um, but... Uh, that's where hey, she's coming from here. So, okay, I'm not in error. All right, Jessica, so why is it that you think that? Um, oh, you don't mention why. Um, you go on to say, so you don't say why you're not in error, but you do say also, so in addition to not being in error, unfortunately you, do, uh, you have no authority to interpret Scripture as well as no power or spirit from God to help you do so. This is kind of what I meant, Jessica, when I said that your response seemed like you're not so much discussing the faith as you are just simply kind of uh, kind of in defense mode. I don't know if that's a good way to put it or not. Um, but like I said, if you feel like I'm personally attacking you, I apologize for that. Um, but as far as what you say here, you have no authority to interpret scripture as well as no power or spirit from God to help you do so, well, turnabout is fair play on that one. I mean, just about any other religion uh, that has anything to do with the Bible and, you know, anything to do with, you know, anything close to a Judeo-Christian concept of God 
um, you know, to a certain extent would claim their right, uh, their exclusive right to interpret scripture and their in, um, ex, uh, exclusive power from the Holy Spirit to do so. I mean, I could, as a Reformed Christian, say that I do not believe that any unregenerate person is going to be able to, you know, correctly interpret Scripture in a salvific way. Um, you know, I could claim that if I wanted to, or maybe if I was Jehovah's Witness, I could say, hey, you're not the governing body, therefore anything that you have, have to say is utterly irrelevant. Um, but frankly, that kind of back and forth, my group is authoritative, yours isn't, frankly, isn't really going to do a whole lot for us, uh, Jessica. It's not going to be a very productive conversation. I can claim my group has the authority, you can claim that your group has the authority, and then what's going to be the deciding factor? Who believes more strongly? Well, if that's the case, the Muslims will win all the shouting matches because that's what they're trained to do. That's how they determine who has the best truth, is whoever speaks the most confidently. And if you've ever spoken with someone who is traditionally um, and culturally uh, from a Muslim area, you understand that's the way they argue. Um, a lot of them are wonderful people, don't get me wrong. But their idea of what accounts for a good argument has to do with how loud you get, how passionate you get, and you know how, how you can bring the emotions out. But of course, you and I both know that that's not really how truth works. Um, truth doesn't depend on claims of who has the authority, and it doesn't depend on how emotional you get when you hear someone else say that you're not right. Um, Hopefully you and I both would understand that that's the case. It doesn't matter how I happen to respond to something. For example, whenever I look at my bank accounts, I respond relatively negatively. I always wish that more was in there. But my feelings on the matter don't change it. And I can say I have the authority to determine what is my bank in my bank account. My bank will very much so disagree with me. You know, it's not one of those kinds of issues. Um, Ultimately, this whole, we have the authority, you don't kind of thing, like I said, it goes both ways. I could claim the same thing regarding the LDS church, but the problem is it's just not going to get us anywhere. And if you're hoping to convince convince me as a, a biblical Christian that the LDS faith is true, or that I should not be concerned about my LDS friends, um, that's not really going to convince me. You know, or anyone who's actually thinking about these things. And I'm not trying to be rude in saying that. Please understand that. I'm just simply pointing out that that particular part of the conversation is not really going to be very helpful because it becomes this tit-for-tat thing that never ends. I'm authoritative. No, I'm authoritative. My group's authoritative. Your group's not authoritative. No, 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 no. It just it doesn't go anywhere. Okay, so I very much appreciate having an extended conversation with you, and I want to have an extended conversation with you, but I want it to be a useful conversation, a good conversation, one that's actually productive to some end. And that kind of argumentation, just because it points up being a, a this for that kind of thing, it's not going to be very useful. Okay, so I'm going to bypass that one just in the spirit of, you know, productivity. Um, you know, just move on to things that are, you know, a little bit more, uh, things that are going to actually move the conversation forward. All right, so then you go on to say, mm -hmm. and interpretations of scripture are not the same as your example of two unrelated things. Okay, for those of you who don't know, which would pretty much be all of you because you haven't been privy to this internet conversation, well, some of you might have, popped in to watch every now and again. Some of you, I think, are just kind of like vultures. You're just waiting to see who dies. Okay, shame on you. Um, but for the vast majority of you, you won't be privy to this conversation, uh, any of the, the preceding information, so you need to know. I um, We had had a little bit of a discussion about the interpretation of Scripture before, and Jessica had said, you know, Scripture can be interpreted any which way. That's why there's all these different groups. And if I'm mis-summarizing you, Jessica, I apologize. Feel free to correct me. Um, but as I understood it, Jessica was basically saying, you know, Scripture can be inter interpreted any which way. That's why there's all these different groups. You leave people to their own devices, and they're going to come up with weird, crazy, strange things. Obviously, you need some kind of authority. That's why we have the prophet and the apostles and, and that kind of thing. And I got back on, and I said, well... 
You know, it's true that you can interpret Scripture in any way that you so choose, but that doesn't make every interpretation right. Let's take a biblical claim, like David is king of Israel, and compare it to an interpretation of that claim, Bob is king of Wonderland. Obviously, they're not the same, and obviously one is right and one is wrong. And if you believe that those are on equal footing, what you're saying is that language has no meaning, that language is basically irrelevant, and that you don't really believe that God have, should have used language in the first place to communicate with us. And so what she is now saying, as far as I understand, like I said, and Jessica, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it seems like now you're saying that it, how scripture gets interpreted is not the same as the example that I gave. But the example that I gave was based in the Bible. It is a biblical claim that David was king of Israel, was he not? I mean, last time I checked, that's a biblical claim. And you could interpret it any which way, right? And you would still have to agree that not all of those interpretations would be right, and you don't need to make any special outside appeals because the language is sufficiently clear. Okay, just because you can interpret it a different way doesn't mean that that's actually what it says, and we all understand that. The question is, what does the text actually say? Not how we interpret it. Okay, so... I'm not really sure what your counterclaim is supposed to be here, Jessica, and forgive me if I'm just missing it, but it seems like you're not really getting the point. My point is basically that scripture says what it says, and it means what it means, and that anyone who actually, through a diligent use of the order, ordinary means, can figure out what that is supposed to be. Yes, there's lots of different interpretations out there, and lots of people come up with some, some really crazy ideas. But those crazy ideas have nothing to do with the text when you actually analyze them in any significant detail. Bob is kingdom of Wonderland is an interpretation. Doesn't have much of a basis in the text, though, does it? So maybe we'll have to come back to that, maybe a little bit more discussion there. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll leave that be for now. And then Jessica goes on, she says, And I'm not sure how the scripture you cited in Deuteronomy... Uh, correlated to the discussion, so I'll just agree. And maybe that is a good question to go on, because when we're talking about a lot of the LDS claims, uh, Deuteronomy is a very significant uh, book of the Bible to examine. Deuteronomy is, for those of us who are biblical Christians, and especially like myself, being a Reformed Christian, and uh, being a sola scriptura, tota scriptura Christian, uh, Deuteronomy has a lot of very important things to say. It's Moses writing to the people, and when he's writing to the people, well, he's initially saying it and it gets written down, and then, you know, and then uh, given to us. But in Deuteronomy, he gives us several tests of prophets, and Deuteronomy 13 is one of those tests. Okay, I'll just begin in chapter, uh, well, chapter 13, but in verse 1. All right, it says, If a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or the wonder that he tells you comes to pass. Okay, so what do we have so far? We have someone who claims to be a prophet, a dreamer, someone who's receiving revelation. They come and say, okay, this thing is going to happen, or they perform some sign of or a miracle, and lo and behold, the miracle that they claim can happen, happens. The future that they predicted, the future event that they predicted is going to happen, actually happens. And, then it goes on from there, it says, and if he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and let us serve them, so the person comes, they have miraculous power, they can predict the future, whatever the case happens to be. They seem to have the kind of divine power you would associate with a prophet, receiving revelation like you would assume a prophet could. If they have all of that, but they say, let us go after other gods, let us follow something else that we have not known, that is not in what we've known up to this point. And if they invite us to go and serve them, Verse 3, it goes on, it says, You shall not listen to the words of that prophet or that dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul. 
So what does this mean? It means if someone comes along and they have all the evidence of being a prophet and everything that they say about us or about this other thing or, or whatever the case happens to be comes true. If they say, hey, if you don't uh, understand what I'm saying, if you don't accept it, whatever the case is, go ahead and meditate on it for a while and pray about it and you'll get a feeling, a divine inspiration that tells you that this is true and you go off and you do it and it feels great and you're like, wow, what he said came true. I'm now convinced in my heart of hearts and I know it to be true. We still have to apply the test of Deuteronomy. What is it that Moses is saying? Even if all that comes to pass, even if you get the feeling, even if the sign over here comes true, the future is told, whatever the case happens to be, if whatever that prophet says comes to pass, great, fine, wonderful, but if they lead you to follow something that you have not known up until this point, that the people of God have not had access to at that point, if they lead you down a different path from what God has originally established, then they're wrong. And the reason why God is allowing this to happen is so you will see what is in your own heart. Do you love the God who, as he first revealed himself, or do you love the God who has amendments? Do you love the God who um, is basically reinterpreted by someone else to make him more fitting or appealing or whatever the case happens to be? The one that gives you the warm, fuzzy feelings or the one who is, you know, able to predict future events and so that you can, you know, figure out what the winning lotto ticket is or whatever the case happens to be. Which God do you love? God, as he revealed himself first, or the God that you came to accept based on whatever ha the other standard happens to be. Deuteronomy is clear that it is the first God that we are to follow. If they come with miraculous power, wonderful, that's great. But if they lead us to follow something that we have not followed from the first, then we are not to follow them. And this implies that access to what we have uh, had at the first will be available to us. If someone comes along claiming, as Joseph Smith did, that basically all of the Christian world had fallen into apostasy and that the truth, at least in its fullness, was no longer known, well, then this standard of Deuteronomy really wouldn't mean anything, right? And if I was going to go against something that what the Bible was teaching, I would first have to undercut the Bible, wouldn't I? If I wanted you to accept it, or put it in more personal terms for you, Jessica, let's say that I wanted to teach something that was in contrary, that was contrary to the LDS faith. I'd first have to claim that the LDS faith was wrong, right? But what are you going to do? Are you going to take my word for it? Or are you going to default to what you first accepted being the LDS faith? I bet you default to the LDS faith, wouldn't you? You're not going to accept it just because I say so, right? No, you're going to look for some kind of a standard. But here's the thing. If the standard I give you asks you to deny a fundamental claim, then that uh, claim is contrary to any standard that you could hold. And that's the same thing that LDS folks do with us biblical Christians. Well, assuming that... The Bible is now riddled with errors and completely unintelligible. You have to pray about it. But what if the Bible isn't unintelligible? What if it isn't riddled with errors? Then you should be able to read it and get the basic meaning. And that's the problem that we have. In your view, I have to assume that the Bible is faulted. If I'm going to pray uh, a prayer, uh, whether or not the, the true church was restored through Joseph Smith, right, Jessica? If I'm going to pray that prayer, what I'm assuming is that what God says in Deuteronomy 13 isn't applicable. Because what Deuteronomy 13 says is it doesn't matter if you get a response to a prayer or not. If it's different than what was first established, it's wrong. You are asking me to violate the commandment of Moses in favor of someone who literally came onto the scene in the 1800s. You, you realize the magnitude of what you're asking. I'm, I'm just curious. Okay, you're asking for an established standard that was established by witnesses, that was seen by witnesses, established by prophets, and affirmed by successive prophets and apostles. You're 
asking me to accept that that standard is wrong over against the testimony of one particular group that comes along literally thousands of years later. Do you understand why that wouldn't be very convincing to a biblical historical Christian like myself? And I'm not trying to be mean about it at all. I'm just trying to let you know what you're saying and what I'm hearing. What you're saying is that you didn't even understand the text in Deuteronomy. You didn't understand what it was about. That it was a test of prophets. That they had to teach what had first been given. And what that tells me is you don't really know enough about the Bible to actually say whether or not it's right or wrong from any kind of objective point of view. You only have from what the LDS church teaches you about it. And that really worries me. All right. And then you go on to say, and no, 1 Corinthians 8.5 does not say so-called gods. And this goes back to another prior discussion that we were having. Uh, Jessica had referred uh, to 1 Corinthians 8.5, which in the King James Version says that there are many who are called uh, gods, many who are called lords. And she said, well, the Bible teaches that there are many uh, uh, gods and lords out there, but for us here on earth, there's just one. And like it, that's my best understanding, Jessica. If I'm wrong, feel free to correct me on that, but that's my understanding, is that you were using 1 Corinthians 8.5 to support the idea that there are other real and true gods that are out there in addition to the God of this earth. Is that a fair assessment? That's what you were claiming? I think so. Okay. So you were claiming that that was the case, and I got back on and said, no, 1 Corinthians 8.5 says that they are so-called gods, not that they're real. And this is Jessica's response. She says, no, 1 Corinthians 8.5 does not say so-called gods, and granted in the KJV it says who are called gods, and it's using it derisively which is why most modern translations say so-called, and everyone agrees that that is the understanding of the text. And then you go on to say, what version are you reading? And the answer is any version, including the King James. That's still what it means. It's using an older form of English. When you say that you're calling something in the older forms of English, it can, it can mean by fabrication. Um, and that's why in newer translations, it's so-called. These things are not true. These things are disingenuinely called this. They are called this thing, but they are not really this thing. Okay, They are simply called this. They are not actually that. That's perfectly in use with the form of English that existed at the time that the King James was written. And then you say you really should stick to the King James Version if you want the closest to the original. Um, no. No, that's not the way that works. A translation that comes on the scene 1,600 years after the fact is not the closest to the original. Okay, I and please understand I'm not trying to be derisive in this. I know that the LDS Church teaches that the King James Version is the version, uh, is the standard version of the church because it is that which best accords uh, with what has been revealed thus far. So they use the King James Version. I get that. That being said, um, please under, try to understand why someone on the outside like myself would not accept that standard at all. You see, um, it's not the case that the Bible, in being transmitted down through history, that they would you know, simply take a, a version of the Bible, make a new version from that, and then get rid of the old. That's not the way that happened. So that, you know, the oldest you know, translation that you can find uh, that's readily available is going to be the best one because it's the, the one that would be closest back to the beginning. That's not the way it works historically. Instead, what you have is um, this multiplication that happens early on. There were all kinds of different regions that the Bible went to, and especially the New Testament, but the Old Testament eventually wound up going to lots of different reason, regions as well um, in the hands of Christians who carried them to all these different regions. So you get all of these different regions um, all within the first century that have their own copies of the books of the Bible. And they're all making independent copies of these things. And because the, all of these copies are in their own regions, they're independent of each other, it's not like 
uh, modern day where you can, you know, send out a mass email to everyone and check in and see how everyone is doing and what everybody's got. It's not like that in the ancient world. Uh, instead, everybody is making their own copies and those kinds of things in pretty much complete isolation from one another. Now, there's a little bit of crossover here and there. Sometimes you'll have someone who will take a journey down from Rome to, say, Hand Jerusalem and things like that. That does happen. But for the most part, it's in isolation. And you have all these different groups making their own copies. And those copies, a good many of them at least, we actually still have today. And we don't have just translations. We have original language manuscripts, not the originals themselves, of course, but original language manuscripts from all these different places that we can compare and contrast with each other. And what is interesting, and some of these manuscripts are really old, like some of the Old Testament ones we have from before the time of Christ. We knew, we know what the readings were of the Old Testament that were available to Jesus and the apostles. There's absolutely no doubt about that. And then as far as the New Testament is concerned, uh, we also have exceptionally great confidence about that as well. Yes, there are some textual variants, um, and they're very well known what they are, and there's entire books published on that subject. And the range, though, is limited. That is, we know what the available readings were at each uh, major point in history. And granted, we can't say what the Bible original readings of the New Testament were with 100%, but we're pretty uh, stinking close. Uh, the last time I calculated it out for the current iteration of the UBS 5, which is the standard uh, New Testament text, the standard academic as well as translational uh, version of the Greek New Testament, which is the one I have right here, by the way. And I don't know if you can actually see any of the words on that, but though that is Greek. Okay, we're not stuck with English translations. That's the Greek. And at this particular point in 1 Corinthians 8.5, there is no major variant or translational issue whatsoever. The word there that in modern versions is translated as so-called is legomenoi. Legomenoi. And that is exactly what it means. It means that something is given a designation that is in no way required to match its actual nature. The designation and the nature do not match in that word. Okay, and especially in the context in which it's used. Oops. Ah, I have to come back and get it. That's what happens when you bump things. Sorry about that. Okay. So there's no major textual variant there. We know what the original reading in uh, the Greek is. It's legomenoi. And everyone who's looked at it with any kind of you know, unbiased hands knows that is a reference to something that is being called one thing but really isn't that thing. Okay, And there's no doubt about this. Christians, atheists, agnostics, pretty much everyone agrees that that is the appropriate reading there, including people who actually speak Greek and know the New Testament Greek language, including myself. Um, not that I'm an expert. I'll grant you that. I do not have a doctorate in those studies or, any, or anything like that. I'm not claiming to be an expert, but, I, but there are many people who are experts who would say that much. The only group who tries to claim otherwise are basically the Mormons, and specifically the LDS. They are the ones who are claiming that um, it means that these were actual gods that Paul was referring to. And they're the only ones who think that. Can you see why that would be more than a little disturbing to a biblical historical Christian like myself? When you have us agreeing with the atheists on what the interpretation of the Bible is supposed to be, people who are of faith and people who are not of faith, people who know the language, people who have just simply analyzed the context in English and said, yeah, well, that's obviously what it has to be, and people who actually get into the language and know it in detail, um, all agreeing on the same thing, and then you have the LDS church over there saying no, it really seems like the LDS Church um, really isn't willing to subject itself to any kind of meaningful historical standard is what it comes down to. It's not willing to subject itself to the standard of Scripture as found in Deuteronomy 13, which says if you start following after something else, even if there's the appropriate signs, power, wonderful feelings, whatever the case happens to be, it's wrong if it's different. Um, LDS Church rejects scripture as originally given. It also 
rejects what it what the Bible has to say in its original languages as understood by practically everyone except the LDS. Um, it's it makes me very concerned. Um, there is nothing uh, in that kind of argumentation that leads me to believe that you really value truth as any kind of objective standard, um, that there is such a thing as objective truth in your worldview. It really sounds like you've basically checked your brain at the door, handed it over to the LDS church, and let them tell you what scripture means, rather than just reading it and trying to understand it with any kind of detail. Because even in the King James, even though it's not the most accurate translation for modern English, even in the time that the King James was written, it was understood that if you're going to make the distinction between saying that something is called this versus it is actually this, that that's meaningful. There's a reason why in the King James it says there are those that are called gods and lords. It makes a very clear distinction, even in the language, that they are not actually gods and lords. They are simply called them. <sighs> I'm not trying to be snarky about it. I really am not. I'm just, I'm really concerned. Um, this is a kind of conversation I would not have with anyone else. Even with Muslims, I wouldn't have this kind of a conversation. And frankly, the Muslims also believe that scripture is, you know, being corrupted and those kinds of things. Originally, they didn't. Um, the Quran actually assumes that the um, uh, that the, uh, the Torah and the Injil, uh, basically the Old Testament law and the Gospel of the New Testaments, uh, in that time were or sufficient to point to Islam. That was the, the claim of the Quran. And of course, we know what the Old Testament and the New Testament looked like at the time of Muhammad, because we have manuscripts from that era, and yet they don't. Um, it's just a historical fact that they don't. And it's a historical fact that legomenoi, the word that's at play here, does not mean that they were actually gods. It means the exact opposite of that. It means that there's a distinction between what they're being referred to as, what they're called, and what they actually are. And you don't get that. Which is the same kind of thing I would expect of my Muslim friends, but even they get that. It really concerns me. I'm not trying to be snarky. I'm just really concerned for you, Jessica, because you're not able to get something that's really obvious to the rest of us. Like, really obvious. Right, then you go on to say, otherwise, you're already letting someone change the interpretation for you, which would explain your confusion. As I pointed out, we have the original language manuscripts, and we know with an extremely high uh, confidence um, level exactly what those uh, manuscripts say, like 99.4% confidence level. And the areas in which we're not as confident are not actually significant to biblical historical Christian doctrine or theology. That is, a lot of the great biblical historical creeds, like the Westminster Confession, uh, London Baptist 1689, a lot of the great uh, uh, canons of Dort, all of the great creeds and confessions of Reformed Christianity on, in their essential aspects are not touched by any textual variants that have been discovered at all. We haven't had to change um, any of our doctrines. Now, granted, because of textual variants here and there, we have changed how we've supported them. Because um, we find out that certain passages were inter interpolations and things like that. But as far as what they are, we've never had to change any of things. As far as any of the essentials are concerned, yeah, there's some areas that we disagree about. Uh, but they're not essential. Um, but the LVS faith... And, like I said, doesn't seem like they'd be willing to subject themselves to any kind of meaningful historical inquiry. And that really bothers me. Okay, that really has me worried. And hopefully it should have you worried too, Jessica. Okay, let's see here. Yes, part of the background is talking about idol worship and false gods. Part of the background? But we are also commanded not to worship other gods before him. True, because the other gods are false. Let's just go back to that passage just to make sure we got the, the full thing here. So 1 Corinthians chapter 8, and we'll just begin at the beginning of the chapter. So 1 Corinthians chapter 8, starting in verse 1. 
Now concerning food and drink offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. This knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. Wonderful promise. And also a great reminder for us in this conversation. Both of us claim that we know what the truth is. Obviously, both of us can't be right. So the question is, you know, who of us has a, a knowledge that is puffs up? And who of us is actually coming into this conversation trying to love the other? Hopefully, we are both trying to love each other in this. Hopefully, we're both trying to show each other that they're in error and that they're wrong. But if that's not the case, then we need to repent. If that's you, me, or both of us. On to verse 4, it says, Therefore, as to, eating, as to the eating of food offered to idol, idols, we know that an idol has no real existence, and that there is no God but one. That seems really clear, doesn't it, Jessica? There is no God but one. But you have to reinterpret it, don't you? You have to say, there is no God of this earth but one. Unless Jesus counts as a God of this earth, too. Uh, but that's a, another aspect of Mormon doctrine and theology that we could get into. But the text in and of itself says there is no God but one. And that's all that it says. It doesn't say of this earth. Okay, that is something that the LDS person has to add and insert into the text. I can read this text just fine as it is, and it matches my beliefs because that's where it's based. But you, being an LDS person, have to filter it through the lens of the LDS church and say, no, that should read like this. And what you're doing is you're correcting the text of God. And like I said, it isn't uncertain. Okay, we have original language manuscripts. We can compare and contrast them. We know what it said, and there's no significant variant here. We know that it did not originally say there is, you know, no God but one of this earth. We know that it didn't say that. But your LDS faith demands that you insert something in there for which there is not one iota of independent evidence whatsoever. And that's really sad, Jessica. That is really sad. Verse 5, for although there are many, we'll use the King James rendering, there, uh, there may be those who are called gods in heaven or on earth. So whether they're called gods in heaven or on earth, that is, of this earth or other worlds that are in the beyond, that's what heaven means, in the beyond. As indeed there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It's not an ambiguous text. For although there are maybe those who are called gods in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God. Father, one Lord, Jesus Christ. <sighs> Jessica, this has me really, really worried if you can't read this and see what it's talking about. There, Paul is talking about food offered to idols, and he says, we know that an idol is nothing. An idol has no real existence. We know that there is no God but one. For there are many who are called gods and lords, yet for us there is one God. It's not saying that there are actual gods. It doesn't work in the context at all. It's talking about idols. Okay, what are these idols to? What are these idols images of? They're images of so-called gods and lords. These are things that are called gods. These are things that are called lords, but we know that they have no real existence, that there is no God but one. And yes, they all have their gods that they worship and they bow down to, and they have food sacrificed to them. But for us, we know that there's one God. That's what Paul is saying, and it's so abundantly clear. 
that you're filtering everything through what the LDS Church teaches you. Just be honest, you are. That's the lens through which you're looking through everything. There isn't a single thing that you said that could be independently or objectively verified. And that has me greatly concerned. And it should concern you too, Jessica. Then you also say, but we are uh, also commanded not to worship other gods before him. And granted, in the Ten Commandments, it does say that. And, of course, that's a different place in Scripture and those kinds of things. But why is it that the case? I mean, if we go back to the Old Testament to Moses' uh, works, where it talks about that, uh, are we going to find something different? You know, where it says, you know, there are other gods, but, you know, you're supposed to only worship me because even though those gods are real, I'm the only one for you. I mean, do you honestly expect that that's what the the law, the first five books of uh, Moses are going to say? You think that that's what it's actually going to say over here? Well, let's go back to Deuteronomy. It's one of those five books of Moses, right where we find the Ten Commandments, and we'll see um, how God describes himself. Deuteronomy 4, 39. By the way, in Deuteronomy chapter 5 is where the Ten Commandments are, in case you don't know. A lot of people just know Exodus 20, um, but you may be more informed than most, and if you are, kudos. Wonderful. Um, but right before we get into the Ten Commandments, God effectively basically describes himself. And this is one of the descriptors that he gives. In chapter 4 and verse 39, um, and this is what it says. It says, Know therefore today, and lay it to your heart, that the Lord uh, is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. There is no other. So can you say that there are gods of other worlds? No, it doesn't work. It says, the Lord, that is, um, when you see all Lord in uh, capital letters like that, that's the translation of the Hebrew tetragrammaton, Yahweh. Um, it's the proper name of uh, God. Um, it's based on the verb hayat to be. It literally means the one who is, uh, the being which is, actually. Um, and by implication, the lone self-existent one. And it says, the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. There is no other. So when it says, you shall have no other gods before him, what is that in the context of? It's in the context of none of those other gods actually being real. There is no other God. It doesn't say any other God for you. It says there is no other God. And again, there is no significant textual variant here or interpretive problem. If you believe contrary to what this verse says, you are believing that despite the evidence, not in an accord with any evidence. You are believing it solely because that is what the LDS Church has told you to believe. But the text itself is really clear. Again, know therefore today and lay it to your heart that the Lord is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. There is no other. So yeah, we are not to have any other gods before him. Why? Because there is no other gods. They don't exist. And this is why Paul, over there in 1 Corinthians 8, could say, we know that a idol has no real existence. They're not really there. They're figments of the imagination. It's not because it's inappropriate to worship someone else's god. It's not because, oh, this is our god and that's their god. Because, I mean, these are gods that were worshipped in other places. You know, gods in heaven. You know, you could, well, why not worship a god of another world? Well, what it says here is because they don't exist. Do you believe that, Jessica? No, you don't. And the reason why you believe it isn't because the text isn't clear enough. The reason why you don't believe it is because the LDS Church has told you that the text is wrong. And then you go on to say, when Jesus said that there was no God before him, he was talking to the people of Israel and about mortality. And about mortality. Where does it say in the text, Jessica, that this was strictly about mortality? You're the one who has to keep adding things in the text. I am the only God of this earth. We know that a God has no real existence, except for the gods who do. 
oh, sorry, that an idol, something that is devoted to a god, has no real existence except for eh, anything to the true god, except for the ones who do. There are many who are called gods, and that means that they really are. No, that's not what that word means. Lakomanoi doesn't mean that. It means that they are called gods. It doesn't mean that they are gods. That was the contrast that Paul was putting in there. They are called this. That doesn't mean they are this. That's the contrast that he's making. Indeed, there are many who we refer to as gods and many who we refer to as lords, but we know better. Again, and moving on with what you say here, you say, again, to us, one God. Where's the to us? Where is the to us, Jessica? Look, if you could find a single verse in the Bible, okay, in the Bible that says that there is only one God to us, it actually says it. I will shut up and I will never bother you again. Ever. Okay, if you can find that verse. Shut up, never bother you again about it. Okay? Promise. Okay? I don't enjoy it, any kind of confrontation, in fact. The only reason why I'm doing this is because I feel that this is an issue of truth and that our eternities are at stake here, either yours or mine. One of us is wrong and one of our eternities is at risk. If you're right and I'm wrong, well... As a Bible-believing Christian who is devout to his faith, I'd at least make it to the second level of heaven. That's not so bad. But for you, if I'm right, that means your eternal soul could fall under ongoing, everlasting, never-ending, eternal torment in hell. And that is not something that I want to see for you, Jessica. That's why I'm doing this. I am very much so concerned. We need to hammer this out. Okay. Again, if you can find an actual verse that says this, that to us there is only one God, I'll stop bugging you about it. Okay. I really do care about you. Okay. Prove me wrong. Find the actual verse in the Bible, not something that uh, the LDS Church has come up with, or that Joseph Smith produced, whatever the case happens to be, or you can say that it was produced by ancient prophets translated by Joseph Smith. Nah, nah, nah. I'm not going to get into all that. But show me in the Bible where it actually says that God is the God of this, uh, only the God of this earth. Where does it say to us? If you can produce it, then I'll stop. But if you can't, then this is something that you really do need to wrestle with, Jessica. Because like I said, one of our eternities is at stake here. And so far, frankly, it looks like yours is the weaker position, doesn't it? Everything you said here is you parroting what the LDS Church has told you to parrot. I don't see any evidence of independent thought here. I don't see any independent evidence whatsoever Instead, this is reinterpretation after reinterpretation of things that are not in the text. To us, one God, there is no to us in those passages. Show it to me if there is. I'm concerned about you, Jessica. That's why I'm doing all of this. And you might not believe it. You might um, think that I just get a, a kick out of going online and saying nasty things about Mormons. I don't. Okay. I do not like confrontation at all. Anyone who knows me knows that I don't like confrontation at all. It's not what I'm about. If I go ahead and I say something, it's because I really believe that it's true and it's important for people to know it. And granted, I'm, I can be a little bit blunt, to say the least, and I apologize for that. And frankly, yeah, I, yeah, I have a problem with sarcasm too. Okay, but please look past all of that and understand that even though I have character flaws and I am still imperfect, as are you, I really do care about you, and I really do care about my LDS friends, and I really do have real concerns. Again, the challenge remains. Find the verse in the Bible that says specifically that there's only one God for us, and you'll shut me up. If not, though, then you have to admit 
that the God of the LDS Church and the God of the Bible are not the same God. Thank you for your time and attention. Goodbye.